business place because why? The women are more tender at the small they are more caring, they listen well. And they, you know, the women they are not actually you know. excessive, you know, because and winner is at the center of all of this. We are thinking boundaries. Right winner is at the center of it all. And I believe before we move on to the second workshop for today, we would like to introduce we would like to introduce the winner trade fair 2022. It's going to happen in November, from November 18th. <laughs> I can see her excellency dancing. That's to tell you how big it is. From the 18th of November to the 22nd of November 2022. It's a fantastic exhibition for both local and international, you know, traders, agribusiness owners, other business owners, regardless of what sector you're in, workshops, business pitch contests, you have the opportunity to win so much. Um, you have raffle draws, you have a food fest, you have the SME award, it's power packed, but I will not be doing the talking, the multimedia presentation will do that so that you get all of the gist. Thank you. Do you know SMEs are disproportionately affected by trade barriers such as access to local and international markets, lack of information, exchange rate and capacity. Inefficiencies resulting from trade policy are major trade barriers that need to be addressed. Now, to promote trade and investment, there's a need to bridge the gap between manufacturers, distributors and end users and to create more platforms for synergy within the value chain. Imagine a space where SMEs from the agricultural sector, IT, and other non-oil sectors are brought together to promote trade and investment and bridge the gap between manufacturers, distributors, and end users, thereby creating more platforms for synergy within the value chain. Imagine an event designed to attract an average of 10,000 daily visitors and over 500 SMEs across Africa. A space that creates an enabling environment for access to new markets, local and international, and investment opportunities for non-oil products and services. Ladies and gentlemen, history is about to be made. The SME industry is about to witness an evolution that will significantly affect the African economy through trade and investments. Women Enterprise Alliance winner presents to you new voices, new trade, the rise of a new trajectory, the hub where SMEs and investors meet and magic is created, another avenue to shoot our made in Nigeria goods out for the world to see. The Winner International Trade Fair is designed to create a platform for SMEs, subnationals, and investors to promote their goods and services, as well as provide local enterprises with a network that fosters opportunities at regional and international levels. This trade fair will amplify investment opportunities in agriculture, technology, and other business sectors, as well as encourage export readiness of made in Nigeria products. From the 18th to 22nd of November, 2022, the Winner International Trade Fair will also be celebrating the Global Entrepreneurship Week, bringing together the best innovators in the SME industry and highlight their important work in nation building. In the city of Abuja, at the prestigious Haro Park, New Voices, New Trade will erect a structure constructed to house a conference or workshop room, an exhibition arena, a VIP lounge, a media area, an experiential area, a food court, a games arena, and a children area. The event is slated to host several speakers and stakeholders in industry trade and investments, as well as participants ranging from entrepreneurs, business professionals, government agencies, and guests from all over the world. The trade fair will be declared open by the First Lady of Nigeria, Her Excellency Hajia Aisha Buhari. There would also be a workshop with conversations that will focus on ways we can strengthen SMEs for productive and inclusive growth 
mobilize SMEs to take advantage of opportunities within the AFC-FTA and also create an ecosystem that provides sustainable development for SMEs. New Voices New Trade will feature product exhibitions, a business pitch contest, a food fest, the When I SME Award Night and raffle draws. SMEs from the sectors will be at the trade fair to showcase their products and services. The exhibition area will be compartmentalized by sectors such as agri, technology, construction, fashion, education, financial service, health service, hospitality, media, and advertising. With varying exhibition booth categories such as the prime booth at 1 million naira, the executive booth at 250,000 naira, the classic booth at 150,000 naira, and the outdoor booth at 100,000 naira. At the business pitch contest, entrepreneurs will be given the opportunity to pitch their business ideas to a panel of judges and investors. Applications will be gotten through the New Voices New Trade Application Portal, where only 10 applicants will be selected to battle for a whopping sum of 3 million naira grant, which will include seed money and business development services for the duration of six months. The Food Fest is an experience designed to showcase the beauty of our culture through native Delhi cases. The Food Fest will take place in the food court area where food vendors will showcase Delhi cases from the six geopolitical zones dressed in their cultural attire. The session will host chef, food bloggers, F&B professionals, culinary artists and food lovers to showcase the versatility of food from various cultures. The food show and cooking competition will hold on the second day to the fourth day of the Wiener Trade Fair, featuring a cooking competition, a food and cultural show display, a food fest recognition, which includes best dressed chef, best food presentation, best food stand, etc. The top three participants will be rewarded with cash prizes of 500,000 Naira for the second runner up, 1 million Naira for the first runner up, and the winner goes home with 2 million Naira. There will be consolation prizes for the other participants. The Wiener SME Award Night is an event that will recognize and honor the achievements of certain personalities and organizations in the SME industry. We believe that SMEs are drivers for employment and technological development in Nigeria and have contributed immensely to the growth of the trade sector. Some of the award categories are Award for Innovation Best Agritech Enterprise, Female Entrepreneur of the Year, Wennerpreneur of the Year, Investors, ETC. The Trade Fair Raffle Draw presents an opportunity for participants to win exciting prizes. Raffle Draw tickets are obtained online at the Trade Fair Registration Portal or physically from vendors. Number tickets are obtained for a sum of 1,000 Naira only, with each ticket having the chance of winning a prize. The drawn tickets are checked against the collection of prizes with numbers attached to them, and the holder of the ticket wins a prize. The raffle draw will be held physically at the Trade Fair Auditorium. This session will also be aired through live streaming on social media. During the event, the raffle spinning drum will be used to select a winner. The winning ticket number will be announced immediately. After winners have been announced, they will be contacted with options for delivery or pickup of the items they won. Winners will be asked to make a short video online, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, with the prizes won appreciating winner and our sponsors for the prize won. Hashtags will be available for winners to use on all our social media platforms. The Women Enterprise Alliance is a registered non-profit organization with a mission to produce world-class and diverse entrepreneurs who meet the needs of an ever-changing marketplace in Nigeria and across Africa. In collaboration with our partners, we design programs to advocate for the 360 degree woman in line with the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. At WINA, we believe that entrepreneurial development is one of the most effective tools to achieving sustainable development in any economy. In the span of three years, WINA has successfully impacted the lives and businesses of over 5,000 entrepreneurs in Nigeria and across Africa. She has hosted programs and workshops that address some of the issues that hinder the development of SMEs, as well as create a forum to address the 360 degree woman. Some of these programs include the winner conferences, winner entrepreneurship programs, financial literacy program, workshops on trade and export, product certification, investment, access to finance, access to market pricing, branding, and packaging. 
Our support assists entrepreneurs to build a lasting foundation for their business, thereby enabling them to contribute to the economic and social development of Africa. You can be a winner gray ribbon sponsor, a winner white gold sponsor, a winner gold statue sponsor, or a winner purple ribbon sponsor. Each of these packages come with exciting benefits. Our winner gray ribbon sponsors would present gifts at the trade fair raffle draw, have hyperlink logo as raffle draw sponsors on the cover webpage with branding on social media as raffle draw sponsor. This sponsorship is at 1 million naira. The winner white gold sponsorship at 5 million naira. Our sponsor gets to present the Winnerpreneur of the Year Award, and the winner of this award will receive a 500,000 grand courtesy of the White Gold sponsor. This sponsorship also comes with an executive exhibition booth for the five days of the trade fair. The winner gold statue sponsorship at 10 million naira. Our sponsor gets to award the Female Entrepreneur of the Year. This award will also be named after our sponsor's brand, and the winner will receive a 1 million grant from the sponsorship. Other benefits include an execution exhibition booth for five days and presentation during the workshop to promote products and services. Finally, the winner purple ribbon sponsorship at 25 million naira. Our sponsor gets to award the winner of the business pitch contest, which is the award for innovation. This award will be named after our sponsor's brand. The winner receives a 3 million naira grant courtesy of our purple ribbon sponsor. 2 million as seed money and 1 million worth of business development services and financial literacy training. Our Purple Ribbon sponsor also gets a prime exhibition booth for the five days of the trade fair. Slots for presentation during the trade fair to promote their products and services and branding on all event materials and on social media. With one heart and similar vision, the tendency of doing more in numbers is huge. The new voices, new trade, Although an initiative of the Women Enterprise Alliance is a goal we believe can be achieved with you playing a major role. Here is a unique opportunity to make history. Partner with us. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Please, another round of applause. So just to, just to emphasize, I mean, what this means, imagine a matrix of businesses where anything is possible. Just imagine a matrix of businesses where everything is possible. Tech is enabling every aspect of our economy at this time. SMEs already make up over 60% of our economy. Agriculture is already contributing 22 point plus to our national GDP as at Q1 of 2022. So imagine that with all of these being the frontier of our economy, you have all of them in one place, doing business, networking, making impact. It is an opportunity you cannot miss. You must partner, you must participate, but beyond partnership and participation, you need to get their people who need to be there. You need to get them to be there. So for more information, partnership and sponsorship, please send an email to partners at winnerwinner.org.ng. Partners, P-A-R-T-N-E-R-S, at winner.org.ng. Please, thank you very much. We move on quickly to the next session. Um, thank you for patiently waiting. The next workshop is the Agric Publication Workshop. The facilitator is Professor Garba Hamidu Sharubutu, the Executive Secretary of the Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria but he's ably represented here by Dr. Mrs. Rufina Chukumalume. Please put your hands together for her as she comes up. Thank you. Thank you. I think so. Yes. 
Good afternoon, the High Excellency. This is Madam Aisha Bangida, distinguished guests, professors in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, my boss, the Executive Secretary, Professor Hamidou Shaributu, is unavoidably absent. He would have loved to be here, but he has another engagement and asked me to be here and to bring back feedback to him. And he really wants to appreciate the good work you've been doing. It's quite commendable. And to go forward, this uh, segment I've been asked to facilitate. I actually did a PowerPoint presentation, but on coming here yesterday, I learned that there are people that ought to present their papers. So I'm only to facilitate. But I need to say something about Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria. I don't know how many of you seated here know about Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria. I would like you to raise your hand, please. It's not encouraging at all. And we are here in Abuja. And to say the little I can say now, because that should be another day's event. We have a new leader, a visionary leader, in the person of Professor Sharaputu, who is just about two years in the office and is doing so much. And I believe this is why we are even here. It is the fourth year. I'm not sure we have been coming to events. You've been? Have we? Okay. So that to show you the kind of leader we have, he believes in visibility. And what is the mandate of ARCN? We are given the mandate to coordinate, to supervise and regulate the Agricultural Research Council, the Agricultural Research System, I mean the Agri Research Extension and Training activities of the colleges and the research institutes. Right now with the reform, we now have up to 16 research institutes and 16 federal colleges of agriculture. And what do we do? I'm sure here we know that it's not just about crop because the presentation has been on crop, crop, crop. We also have the livestock. We have the fisheries. So basically we have issues that cover almost all the commodities, ranging from the roots and tuba, which we have in Umudike. So if you're into such commodity, you need to know the institute to find information from. And we can't do agriculture without research. That's the bedrock of agriculture. Until we got into the transformation agenda that made us to know that agriculture is about business. I think it's now expanding the horizon that it's not just uh, the small scale farmers that should be into that. What am I trying to say? No matter the commodity you are into, there are already research institutes that have been given the mandate to research into the genetic improvement of the commodity, the production, the process, and utilization. But because we have not been so known, many are not aware of that. So to not take much of your time, we have one of the latest things that have been achieved is radio TV that was launched last year by the new e executive secretary. We now have agricultural radio for the first time and agricultural television. So would they would have been here, but they already attended another agro fair. So I pray that next time they will be officially invited. I wanted to bring them along, but there's another event going on. And when we are talking about publication, what is it all about? Information are there in the research institutes. People are not aware of it. It's not just about publishing. They say publish or perish. It's not just that we should be thinking the, when I saw the theme, I say it has a lot to tell us. One, we are not getting it right, and we need to move into the right direction. So that's the thinking cap we are putting on being here, that we have what it takes as a nation to be fully secured. And we are not yet there. 
So this kind of conference is bringing us to think right and move forward. I believe there will be action points that will be taken from this conference that by next year, we have to review how far have we journeyed with the action points that we have marked for this day. So not taking much of your time, the website for ARCN is uh, www.arcn.gov.ng. So I just mentioned one of the 15, of the 16 uh, research institutes. We have for fresh water, we have for marine water, fishery research, that's the NEOMA, the NIFRI. We have the one for extension, that is Zaria. So many of them, I can't just start listing them now. But what am I trying to drive home? Publication. We are here to, the segment is on agricultural publication. It's not just about journal, peer-reviewed uh, peer uh, publication. We should have a rethink of publishing for development. We are not yet there. We focus so much on how many publications have I produced, 100 papers, 120 papers. How are they addressing the problems on ground? Are they really on demand-driven research? So the focus is not just to publish, but to communicate our research findings effectively down to the end users, be they the farmers, the industrialists, and the, event, the investors. So the publication we should be focusing on is not just publication because I want to publish, I have my papers published, I have uh, 120 publications in peer review journals. It goes beyond that. Proposals can come out for those publications. The investors can invest in. So I wouldn't want to continue on that. My work is to facilitate the presentations on these segments that following the theme, I have here four presenters, so to say, so they're going to be called. We have one hour, 30 minutes for this segment. I want to keep to time. And what that means is that for each presenter, he has 10 minutes to present, five minutes for co, somebody that might also draw light to the topic, and then five minutes for questioning. We have four presenters, like I said. So I wouldn't want to take much of your time. We we'll start speaking now. The first presenter will come up and give us his own presentation in line with the theme of the of the conference. And like I said before, I want the convener to please. I want to take back information to my boss going forward. Where can we partner? Are there things we can do together? With our radio, TV, we have museum, we have e-library. So many things are brought in under two years of his uh, tenure. The first presenter, um, um, the area of agri-economics, I will call on Professor Abigail John Jirgi. If I don't get the name right, please, pardon me. A round of applause, please. We have 10 minutes. I am told um, uh, somebody, Dr. Sao Wisa, Dr. Agatha, here with you to contribute. So please. Yeah, thanks, Sao Kanti. Excellency Hajia Aisha Babangida all dignitaries here present, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Yes, I would want to sincerely apologize that uh, myself, my colleagues, and I did not prepare PowerPoint presentation. This is because there was a breach in communication and our letter read that we are coming to participate in this great conference. So we are sincerely sorry about that. And we hope that next time when we are invited, we will do in-depth research on the topic that will be given to us. Thank you very much. Yes, we are talking about rethinking paradigm shift in agriculture and incentives to enhance food security. Now, to start with, 
it is not all the time that we will start listing what the government and the international donors have not done, what they have not been able to achieve. But I want to start by um, saying this, that uh, we want to appreciate the founder of WINA for inviting the academia to this educative conference. Now, the efforts of the federal and various state ministries of agriculture and rural development, water resources, environment, ministry, uh, in Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission, the Central Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria Export Promotion Commission, the Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria, ARCN, um, the, agri uh, the all academic institutions. We want to say that we appreciate these institutions for what they have been doing with respect to developing agriculture in Nigeria. I remember over the years when I was doing my degree program, most of us, the recommendations we were given is lack of financial institutions, lack of this, lack of that, lack of that. Now, I think we have moved from lack of, we are now saying inadequate financial support services, inadequate extension services. Agri students are here. You want to believe with me? Yes. So we are going somewhere. We are moving ahead. Now, I will also want to say a big thank you to donor agencies and NGOs like what Her Excellency is doing in the development and implementation of several agricultural related projects and programs in Nigeria. We have them, we have seen evidence we have seen progress in, among farmers and entrepreneurs that were helped by these donor agencies and NGOs. Now, back to our theme, rethinking paradigm shifts in agriculture and incentives to enhance food security. Now, from the point of view uh, of an agricultural economist, I am concerned with the following key areas that uh, relevant stakeholders should address. Now, we talk about efficiency in production. In economics, we are not just talking of production. We are not just seeing entrepreneurs that are just putting their money into the business without making gains. We are after maximizing profit and minimizing cost. And so um, it, is, it is important that such areas are focused on while people do their business. We also need data on farmers, marketers, processors, I mean digital data, comprising of the, the farmer's personal information, communication, location, farm details, information on livestock, production information, financial institutions, credit, insurance, qualification, business information, farmers, organization. Because any support coming from most of our donor agencies and even NGOs, whether they are local or international, they want a medium to operate on. And most commercial institutions now rely on farmer organization. It you know, provides like my neighbor, my neighbor is my collateral. Because when you are doing business, you are uh, an entrepreneur and you have your group, you wouldn't want to disappoint whoever is giving you services. Now we also need to invest in research and development as key in achieving food security and environmental sustainability. We were talking about testing of the food we eat, the food we export, the products we export. Now, yesterday it was said that there is no single, it is very difficult to get 
a lab where standard standard tests are conducted for these products that we want to export. What do we do? We need to invest in that area. Now, we also need to develop our local markets. We are talking about aggregation, standardization, market information system. The farmers, the entrepreneurs need to be educated. More sensitization should be done. Adia is doing a lot, and I want to believe that she will do even more. Now, um, finally, I would like to say that um, farmers need to be sensitized on some of the key things that are coming out from this conference. Yesterday, we talked about water harvesting, and we talked about uh, diversification, crop intensification, integrated farming, organic farming. We had over an hour lecture on uh, organic farming. These are technologies and innovations that uh, farmers need to be sensitized on. Finally, I would like to say, sorry with my finally, uh, that if you want to be food secured, you have to mainstream gender and develop gender-friendly technologies with local content. And I want to say that we have several policies, but we need accelerated political will to drive the implementation of all the agricultural-related policies. Thank you. Wow. Of this. Okay, okay. Please, uh, we are limited to time now. Can the contributor to this paper also come up? I don't know, is it Dr. Sawisa or Dr. Agatha? Who is coming? One person, please. The name is Dr. Ezekiel Salau Yisa. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Excellency, and all the other guests that are here present. I don't want to dwell on the uh, formalities again. Uh, my head of department and uh, Professor Jirgi has already given an overview of the presentation. Uh, I'm only going to glean on a few things that she has raised. And I want to uh, reiterate that if we are going to rethink paradigm shift in agriculture and the initiatives to enhance food security, then we must make every effort to produce more. If we must be food secure as a country, we need to produce more. And if we have to enhance production, then it means we must enhance productivity at the farm level. Now, we've had several presentations, and I know that uh, all that we have been talking about is aimed at making Nigerian farmers more productive, and to increase their incomes. Now, if their incomes must be increased, and like I said, the level of productivity has to increase, then we have to look at how the farmers employ the resources or the inputs at their disposal. And if these inputs are efficiently utilized or employed, then we can think about increased output from their investments on the farm. Now, it also brings to question the availability of these inputs and how it gets to the end users. I know the system is fraught with a lot of uh, challenges, but several efforts are being made by government and other uh, stakeholders to overcome these challenges. Uh, she raised an issue about data, and I think data is very, very important. The information coming out from 
the research institutes from the institutions like the universities and other institutions that are working with these uh, farmers need credible data that is segregated in line with gender. I know Wena is working a lot with women, uh, women entrepreneurs. If we don't have data that is related or that clearly indicates the position where women are in all of this, it becomes a challenge. Uh, it looks like my time is off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. A round of applause. We are really constrained, but I think they've said so much. And the one thing that is key there is about data. And um, I think the essay to Honorable Minister on Agriculture mentioned something about having information about um, farmers all over the country. I think we can start from there. Because one thing, the bank will say, know your customer. I think it's time we have to develop know your farmer. Then again, we can't talk about traceability. And without that, we are not going anywhere across the globe. If we must have a crop or commodity competitive, we must have traceable record that you can trace to the farm where the commodity is coming from. So it can only be possible where we have identified our farmers, have a kind of uh, number or system that we can trace them. So that is well noted. And uh, I believe um, WINA is doing so much. And I know they can take it from there. It's not just about government doing it all. I think the private sector is driving it now. And that would be quite commendable if we have a traceable system in Nigeria. More, let us also give the group another round of applause. I will not highlight all that I've said, the issue of gender, and that comes up again on issue of issue of policy implementation. The ministry has uh, documents on gender in agriculture, but we know the problem is about implementation. We get there with the voice like winner, we keep um, saying it, and one day we get there. It's better that we have it than we don't have it at all. And then the issue of research, you also highlighted it. It's not just the government doing it alone. Commod Agro-based commodities can come together, get to the issue that has the mandate, find a way to get their problem solved. It's about problem solving. And it's not just government that will fund the research alone. The Unida person mentioned about Kenya and South Africa, if I should add that one. They are far because they are investing in research. We are, research is at the background in Nigeria. That's all the truth. And we can't continue like that. So for that paradigm shift also, we need to invest in research. Agro-based commodities, um, organized sectors can see how they can fund a particular research. Take uh, uh, the issue of post harvest losses. It's been there. Our products are rejected because we don't meet the standard. An NGO can key into that. It mustn't be the farm, it mustn't be the government doing it. So we pray that with this kind of gathering, we are thinking and we also go into action. Moving forward, the second presenter, a professor of food science and technology, Dr. Mrs. Nonye Anumba. A round of applause for her, please. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Good afternoon, all dignitaries here present, professors in our midst, the academia, and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Noye Anumba. I am not yet a professor in food science and technology, but we'll get there. I'm actually here to represent Professor Ocheme, who was invited for this function because um, he's unavoidably absent. I have a slide. I managed to scribble something, even though I was told I was just coming to sit like on a panel and all of that, but I managed to put something together. 
Um, I'm going to give us a food science and technology perspective on the topic in question. Because um, at a point I was feeling intimidated. I said, it's only farmers I'm seeing in the house. Please, do we have any processor here? Just by, okay, that's impressive. Um, I'll tell us a little story about, I won't take time. The first time I ever tried to farm in my life, I never got it right. <laughs> because um, I know that in the value chain from the farm, you have something in between. I kept asking my mom then, I said, must I do this part? You know, the putting of the seed in the soil and everything. And to tell you, I don't know if that's what is called mixed cropping, but I put the egusi and beans and everything inside the same hole because I never got it right. <laughs> so I quickly advised myself and switched to the processing part of food. So I'm here to let us know, because this is an enlightenment session, to let us know that in the value chain, you have the processor. And the processor, I don't think there's anybody here that will harvest a raw yam and start chewing. Hello? I don't think so. But by the time the yam goes through some processes, which is where we represent, it can now get to your table and very palatable as well. Okay, quickly. We have, um, can I get the slides please? We have five components of food security, and that's um, food availability. You have the food access, the food utilization, stability, and malnutrition. I'm going to dwell a little on, of course, the farmers are giving us the food. We are assuming already the food is available. And we also assume you have access to this food. Now, how do you utilize this food? Let's go forward. We also have complex, okay, the complexity of food security. Food security is a very complex project. It's a very complex topic because there are so many aspects of food security. If you go to the agro part, the environmental part, the biological part, where you talk of health and diseases, if somebody is not healthy, the person cannot assimilate food. You go to the socioeconomic part, where we are talking of poverty, we're talking of empowerment, where I believe WINA is representing greatly. You talk of if somebody doesn't have money, you cannot have access to good food and nutrients. So moving forward, I'm trying to rush through all this because of want of time. Now, a lot of people have talked about this, but I'll just throw a little light on it. Just imagine that we are having higher demand for water and there is a projection globally that by 2050, the demand is going to increase by 55%. That's more than double of what we have now. I think presently we're already having water scarcity. Some of us that use seaway water, hello. Who uses seaway here? I think it's grew from 400 naira per bottle to 550 to... Okay, it's 800, thank you. So, and you, you bet that probably with the inflation rates we're seeing, we might see it getting to almost 1,000. And what does that tell you? There is already scarcity coming in. And I really learned a lot from this workshop because I've heard about um, harvesting water and so many other aspects where you try to collect your groundwater, you do a lot of things so that this water don't go away. So... Again, we are talking of energy consumption, and that by 2035, there is also a global projection that we're going to be demanding extra 50% of the energy we use. I think we're already seeing something happening in the diesel shortage we have in Nigeria today, because I tried to bring in the, let's move away for, we'll be juggling between the classroom and real life. Everything is not about theory. Right now, diesel in this 2022 rose from 
was it 400 per liter to about 850 per liter? And that is already a big problem for farmers. And when we are talking of maximizing profits, energy is one of the major issues we are facing as a country presently. And also, with the projection we have globally, we are also looking at the problem with demand for food. If you have the population increasing drastically the way it is presently, that tells you you have more mouths to feed. Somebody mentioned here that um, um, seed, something about seed or something. I think the man in front took it then. If you have more people in the population, what does that tell you? You need to grow more food. And when you are growing more food, you need to process them so that you don't waste them. Now, talking about, we are going to look at how we have a nexus between energy, water, and distribution of safe food. Now, what is food science and technology? Food science and technology is application of food science to preservation, selection, processing, packaging, distribution, and use of safe food. Note there that I use the word safe food. If food is not safe, what are you gunning for? Infection, diseases, and what have you. And if the economy, if the people that make up the economy are not healthy, of course, we have what? Low productivity. So we go on to the next slide. Now, from our food science and technology perspective on the topic we are discussing today, which is the paradigm shift on innovation on food security. Food security can cause malnutrition. For example, poor access to food. Let's give an, I saw um, a project that someone is handling on trying to prevent early birth among teenage girls and all of that. Imagine a girl of 16 having a child and there is no help from anywhere. Already, what does it tell you? That that child is going to be malnourished. It will be difficult for that mother to assess good food to be able to feed that child. And if a child does not get the right nutrients, malnutrition sets in, and of course, you have low productivity. Now, okay, I've even, I've even talked about that. Then in adults, you have poor productive capacity and frequent illness. Can we go to the next slide? I'll just run through that. So we have three R's we use in food science to curb food security. And I will say reduce, reuse, and recycle. Reduce what you have in the wastage. When we talk of food loss and food wastage, some of us in the, um, just a while ago we were there to have lunch. I, know, I noticed some people, if you notice when the waiters were packing the trays, you saw a lot of rice being leftovers on the plates and all of that. We are told that one third of all the food the farmers are producing are trashed. And what does that tell you? Globally, it's not just about Nigeria. And what does that tell you? We are losing a lot from that sector, food losses and food wastage. So we use that because, of course, it's a threat to food security. Next, please. Next slide, please. So, like I said earlier, you cannot talk about food security without food safety. There is a lot of projects going on right now on food safety. And what does it tell you that what is on your plate? How safe is it? We talk about outside catering at times like the people that served us lunch. I'm always having jittery when people are serving and you hear them talking. Like I saw somebody arguing about, give me the tail of chicken. I was like, Jesus, this thing is getting into... Because as you're talking, something, saliva is going into the food. And that's why sometimes you go to a party. The person that arrived early eats comfortably and goes home. You come later, much later, and you eat the same food. And already, if you, if you have the opportunity to see a microscope, 
on that food. Oh my God, you'll never eat again. So food safety is something that we need to really, really keep as a watchword because there are so many practices about that. Like I said, we are racing, racing through all this because the moderator of this program is not smiling. Before you know it, she's standing here. Um, way forward, because we're here to look at innovations. Okay, global issues, I think I've talked about that. Prices are rising and all of that. So let's go to the way forward. There is presently a lot of things that is happening behind closed doors in terms of food processing. First of all, I want to ask, who has ever seen iodine salt? Hello, iodine salt. Is the, have you noticed iodine is now included in your salt? You know, that was not the idea before. Some of us are old. Hello. <laughs> before now, we had this salt in bags. You just go to the market, you buy it, they scoop it for you. Now, if you go home, check your pack of salt. It's now added with iodine. Another one is your rice. Vitamin A, hello, vitamin A fortification of rice. What are we trying to do? The food processors are trying to transport micronutrients just to curb the issue of malnutrition, micronutrient deficiency, macronutrient deficiency. And this is what one of the vehicles they use to achieve that. Another one is the um, use of GMOs. I laugh when I see a lot of people protesting, why do we use GMOs? They are not healthy, they are this and that. But the truth is that there is a body in Nigeria that their work is to certify the safety of every GMO product that comes into the country. And there is a lot of seedlings, for instance, that are already modified. For instance, we have the cowpea, pod borer resistant cowpea. And what is that seedling supposed to prevent? That these um, things that bore into, I'm, not, I'm going into an area I'm not very familiar, but you know what I'm talking about, you are farmers. So there are a lot of products now that are being brought into the country and they are already GMO certified safe. I told you she's coming. So the next one, I've talked of food safety. I will talk a little about post-harvest losses. And post-harvest losses, you talk about um, how to keep your food products from being thrown away. I don't know if we are current with what's happening now because of the warning. Um, I think bread producers just called off their strike because of the Ukraine war and all of that. Now, there is a, the spotlight is on cassava flour production. Because cassava flour, there is a lot of potentials to use cassava flour as either you use it to supplement or even wholly use it to produce bread. And if we're able to do that, what does it tell you? That the past cassava um, production in Nigeria is already going to make a lot of, a lot of money. And I want to talk about, I'll just run through, madam, one second. You know one thing about this, my presenter, when she takes the mic now, she'll take our own time. <laughs> so, um, lab-grown meat. There is meat now grown in the lab because of the gas emission of animal production. And in the nearest future, some of the meats you will be eating will be that. <laughs> See her excellency's face. There are still meats, just like you have your soil. You grow them in the lab because we're trying to save the environment. The issue of climate change and everything is becoming a major issue. And food production, animal production, is causing a lot of gas emission in the environment and is becoming a serious issue. The only thing we are asking is that research should do all the, we are doing all we can to make sure that it is healthy for human consumption. And of course, you know that cockroach milk is coming. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the tomato paste. We have the tomato paste, which is a way you try to preserve your tomatoes. 
Then dehydration. Yesterday, I bought dehydrated pineapple. I don't know who saw that. They have reduced, removed the moisture because most of the bacteria act on your food because of moisture. So the technology now is that you remove the moisture and you get this food products very, you know, they last for a period of time. So I bought tomato, um, pineapple rings dried yesterday for 1,000 naira, and it was very nice. And thank you. Where are you doing? Did you mention it? Where are you coming from? Did you mention? Please. Sorry, she said I didn't mention where I'm coming from. I find it always very difficult to introduce myself because I do a lot of things. First of all, I'm a fashion designer. <laughs> Secondly, I'm a food scientist. Thirdly, I'm a data scientist. And um, I also do a lot of things. So I'm open for collaboration. I'm from the private sector. Thank you. Please, another round of applause. I really didn't want to disturb her until she called my attention that I don't smile. <laughs> I'm also a food scientist and I need to support her. And um, she has said so much because uh, the, the challenge has always been on um, processing. Most of the time, efforts have been on production, production, with little or nothing on the processing and add value addition. So, please, I want to mention at the end of the whole presentation, there will be question and answer. The presenters will be called as you ask your question, you direct it to the presenter, the person will answer. So we are trying to up up time. We want to give all the presentation and then at the end of it, we'll give time for questioning. Uh, she said, I take much of the time talking about my own, so I won't say anything again. Straight to the next presenter, crop production. I'm calling on Dr. Dania Emmanuel. A round of applause, please. Her Excellency Hajia Aisha Babangida, dignitaries here present, participants, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Emmanuel Daniel once again from Department of Crop Production, Federal University of Technology, MENA. Um, rethinking paradigm shifts in agriculture and initiatives to enhance food security, crop production perspective is what I want to share with you. My work has been made easy from yesterday till today. What are we talking about? The new approach towards crop production. And if we look at the biggest feeders, developed countries such as US and China, they feed themselves. What, have they, what did they do? They all embraced technology. And in Nigeria too, it is no different. But what is the approach? And the approach now is looking out at the market. And if we are looking at the market, we are looking out for exports. So now from the academia, we have so much research dumped on the shelves that fits in into our own environment. For me, as a crop production person, I would like to look at the farming system and now see which of these technology would fit in. The paradigm shift here in crop production include looking at climate change. If I may be permitted, that is the heart of food security. So since from yesterday and today, how do we resolve this? There is no way we can run away from adopting smart agricultural practices. It is a must so that we'll be able to have increased productivity, improve resilience, and as well mitigate climate change. Another paradigm shift is to make sure that we diligently follow the crop production packages that are available. I want to thank at least the ARC and here. Most of the research institutes have packages. And I will tell you that just some few days back, we were looking for a particular uh, package for improved agronomic practices for sweet potato 
it wasn't there. I had to start putting calls to them. So I think a lot has to be done by these institutes so that we do. Simply, I can, I can easily Google now, feed the future and see improved production packages made by several crops. So much of this thing exists. It is known to us that if I want to do miscropping, for example, maize and cowpea, two ratio, four ratio two is optimum for, the, for, 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 for yield, both maize and cowpea. These are things we, used, we, we, we need to know. And a lot of these things exist out there for us. Now, all year round, the third one approach is that all year round, we need to produce crop. And this is, this must be, this is a paradigm shift that can force down the prices of these foods. And how can we do that? We need to embrace irrigation. And we've got it here. Modern irrigation, but I have my worries. And maybe the organization, well, now we have to look at it, especially for those in the urban places. I mean, the urban farmers, those farmers, small scale holder farmers that are involved into irrigation. What is the source of water? What is the kind of water? What, what is the quality of that water? I'm afraid. I'm from Mina, Mina municipality. I see a lot of things there. A lot of those types of um, irrigation happening there. You see the kind of water already filled up with heavy metals. And this is what we consume. I am also a victim. So I think the organization can look at it. Then the development of simple handheld tools for field activities is key. Here we see all kinds of videos going on. From beginning, when the child begins, he knows how to farm in the village, he begins to bend down till when? Nobody knows. We need simple handheld tools that can, be, that can fit into the farming system. And that calls for what? Looking at the local content when we are fabricating all, all these things. Uh, I belong to a group. Okay, by the time we get there. Then the next one is soilless farming. We have soilless farming today. That is the paradigm shift into aeroponics, aquaponics, hydroponics. I want to tell you a story that just within this ASU strike, we had an organization, Federal University of Technology, Mina, who donated a hydroponics for us. It's being constructed here, although we have not finished. The challenges are there. So it is meant to train people. And I actually supervise that construction. And I hope that by the time they're able to finish up, we'll be, we'll be happy to train people out there. And uh, yes, there was an issue that some of these things are not known to us in the academia. It's true. Prof is here. You see that the curriculum handed to us by the NUC does, says nothing about precision farming. And even the admission intake of agriculture, most especially as those that read agriculture, some of them never wanted agriculture. They were pushed there. So we are looking at places, things that can entice youth now into what agriculture. So now adoption of precision agriculture is one other thing again that we need to adopt. And precision agriculture in Nigeria is still very low. I belong to a precision agriculture research group, and we we won a research grant, and we are now trying to develop an autonomous robot system that will be used for herbicide application in maize production. This is what we are thinking. But then at the end of the day, I'm already even seeing the cost. Will the farmers be able to buy it? Some of our surveys that we have done already, they are already crying out. They have, some of them do not have association. So, but then these are the things. Now, the whole thing, in as much as these things are good, it boils down to government policies. The way, can they diligently uh, uh, use that? Can they diligently accept all these things that we are saying they should do? Now, so far, so good. To Wena, these are some of the gaps I have seen so far from the discussion yesterday and today. We, there is the need for you to, to source, to look at the source and quality of irrigation water used in urban areas, especially for irrigation. Two, you can identify the agroforestry system that can protect the soil from degradation, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, in order to enable carbon trading. We can you can look at development of efficient water harvesting technologies for all these uh, irrigation farmers. We can, you can also look at development and adoption of efficient precision agriculture technologies. Now, education of the farmers and those of us interested in agriculture is required. Some of the agri-business opportunities have also 
I uh, have also observed in this conference is that we now can look at community-based seed and seedling production system, especially in field crops, uh, in field situation, as well as in, in the greenhouse. It can also, the organization can also look at community-based organic fertilizer and other soil amendment production, like biochar. Biochar production. We have so many materials here that locally we can do that. That will help enhance what? The soil nutrient mitigate all these greenhouse gas emission. Then again, I think the last one is community-based agroforestry system for carbon trading. That will involve research. We'll look at what types of plants, what types of trees and crops can go in together. Now, the question still boils down on, on diligent political will as well as what? Policy. Now, for example, one of the paradigms you can just say, oh, every sustainable, every smallholder farmer should integrate legumes in his or her farming system across all agricultural landscape. Or we can simply say, oh, if you know you're a fish farmer, you have to integrate it with vegetable production. Already aquaponics is coming in. These are some of the things I think I've been able to highlight from this conference. Thank you. Thank you. And a round of applause for him, please. It's like um, most of the things he mentioned have already been captured, and then I will not need to go back repeating them. The um, soilless farming. Then the other thing that I mentioned I need to highlight is on the issue of uh, having a child growing up with farming by with hoe until the person is old, is still farming with hoe. So I think that's where ICT comes in and to get the youth into agriculture is with this kind of innovative farming, like she detailed it. So I, that's another thing that Aristotle is doing, which is uh, having adopted villages and adopted schools. Like he rightly said, many people go into agriculture is not get, when they didn't get admission to read medicine, to read the pharmacy, they now fall back to agriculture. Now that is their first choice, of course. So trying to catch them young, we have what is called adopted schools in all the states, and it's also to encourage them from secondary school to choose agriculture as a course. So and going forward, that might also need to integrate the practice of soilless farming and the, all this innovative farming might start from the green garden can be a way to also get them to accept agriculture and start using agriculture as a way of um, earning income. While we have the edge going out, the youth should come in and embrace agriculture when it's like this ICT involved, precision farming, Songhai farming, and the rest of them. That will go a long way to attract them. So another round of applause for him, please. We, the time is almost spent. We have the last paper, or the last presenter from Water Resources, a professor. I have here Professor Rashid Ojikutu. Sorry if I didn't get the pronunciation right. And to be assisted, is uh, Mr. Israel Kidron or Mr. Eliezer? One of them, please, should come and assist after your presentation. Let's save time. Thank you very much. Um, Your Excellency, Madam Hai Shababangida, please permit me to remain afloat on the already established protocols. Um, since yesterday, we've been here, and somebody rightly observed that it's as if it's only that we produce in this country. There is nobody that is talking about fisheries. Yes, I'm from the Department of Water Resources, Aquaculture, and Fisheries from Federal University of Technology, MENA. Um, people don't know how to pronounce my name well, except probably Yorubas among us. Um, Rashid Olakunli Uju T. Iku. Uju T. Iku, that is a shame. Um, Yorubas will understand the meaning. 
But for some of us that do not understand, probably during the time of my great, 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 great grandfather, at least maybe when he was given back to, he would go back and come back. Finally, at a point he stayed, and that was when they said, Oju T. Iku. Well, my time has been reduced from 10 minutes to five minutes. I will try as much as possible to make sure. So we'll be talking from the perspective of water resources, aquaculture, and fisheries. Um, and the title of the paper is A Global Perspective on Sustaining Water Resources and Fisheries, Transitioning Beyond Existing uh, Paradigm to an Integrated Ecosystem Approach. Um, yesterday, the Minister of Water Resources was here, and he was uh, talking about the resource. We have water, abundant water resources in Nigeria. And you recall that capture fisheries, in terms of capture fisheries, because we have capture, we have culture fisheries. Capture fisheries is from the wild. Around 50s to 60s and 70s, we had very skyrocketed increase in the catches worldwide. Um, there was a researcher at that time, Thomas Oxley, who proclaimed that um, harvesting those things will not be affected. But he didn't consider us at that time, or, or he never knew us at that time that there was going to be population explosion. And suddenly we had population explosion, and these resources must be exploited. And it's exploited in such a way that it's as if it's going to recede itself. What I mean by recede itself, it's going to regenerate immediately, uh, without considering the fact that uh, it will take time before they regenerate. So these resources were over-exploited, and at the point, it reached maximum. And when it reached maximum, what next? Zero. And fish is very, very proteinous. And people have said it long ago, that it has no any side effect. There are some that have argued that fish protein has side effects. But I tell you that it has no side effects. When it has side effects is when you use some um, ingredients to culture this fish. You understand, you try to break the process of the maturity. Of course, it will remain in the system of, of the fish and you will consume them. Then, at that point, it, has, um, it will have some effect on us. So, um, Lake Chad, for instance, the, the minister mentioned about Lake Chad and he was talking about the water stress without minding or considering even the resources that are available in this Lake Chad. When Lake Chad was impounded, it has a service area of 26,000 kilometers square. And you imagine the kind of resources that will be available in such water body in terms of the fish and the employment that that generated as at that time. But as of today, it has reduced to 1,500 kilometers surface area. You see that wide reduction to more than half of its capacity when it was impounded. And what does that translate to? It translates to loss of job, change in biodiversity of the water body. To some extent, there are some fish species that go into extinction. And when they go into extinction, it means that reduction in fish production, which would negatively affect us uh, in terms of reducing food security. Then how do we solve this problem? Uh, people attributed this to climate change. Uh, it is not only climate change. It's actually probably the way we manage these water bodies. Um, like I said, it will take, it will lead to dwindle, it, it has led to dwindle resources. And what do we do? What do we need to do to make sure that we tap maximally from these water bodies, from these water resources that we have? You know, we treat our water bodies in such a way that when something is available to all, it means that it is owned by none. Then it means that we need to begin to think of uh, managing our system in such a way that it is a rights-based management system that is involved the user decision making, the user decision in the decision making process. That is the community. Allow the community to take ownership of those water bodies because when they take ownership, you just encourage them, tell them what to do, and those water bodies will be managed. Like the representative of ARCN mentioned, we have so many research institutes. One of them is she mentioned Nifuri. We have Nihoma. These research agents institutes were established with mandate of trying to make sure that our water bodies are replenished. We are supposed to get seeds and uh, replenish these water bodies so that in the nearest future we'll be able to harvest, harvest them. But unfortunately, you go to some of those research institutes now, you'll be sorry because when they were established in the beginning, you see them flourishing well. 
so many things are coming from there. Then this boils down to government in terms of funding some of these research institutes well. One of my senior colleagues spoke yesterday, Professor Kuta, you know, when people like this speak, uh, especially they are in academics, they have been in the politics. You see some politicians will not tell you the truth. They will come out and say, no, everything is okay. But when he talked yesterday that institutions, we are on strike not because of ourselves, but because of having better education for generations that are coming. Imagine a situation whereby government is proposing that students should be paying one million naira per session. And as we say, no, we will not accept that. It means that majority of our children will not be able to go to school. That is the implication. They were ready to pay professor any amount we want, but we said no, we'll sacrifice for the future of these children. And that is what we, and he mentioned it categorically yesterday, and that is what is even happening to our research institutes. I went to um, National Agency for Biotechnology day before yesterday. You see the aquaculture facilities that are there, but now it's grown with grasses. Nothing is happening there any longer. It means that these agencies are not being properly funded. And this is where you can get results, especially to farmers. Somebody was saying farmers are not interested in um, investing in research. Yes, because what they are after is results to get money. But it's the work of researchers in institutions and research institutes to make sure that we get the best and give to the farmers. You see, everything we are doing today, we talk about innovation. The innovation is not the problem. It is we that are adopting the innovation that are the problem because we are not looking at our own environment. We just go and adopt something and bring it, accept it, hook, line, and sinker, without considering our own system. When you adopt such innovation, you look at your system and you make sure that things are done rightly. I will be telling you what we are doing as an institution or what we have been able to do as an institution. Please permit me, I won't, like I said, oh, Madam is already coming. So culture fish, now we go into aquaculture. Aquaculture over the last few years has increased sporadically. Yes, because of the fact that the, the, because of the reduction in the catch from the wild and people have gone into aquaculture. But of recent, between 2016 to 2018, we have witnessed serious reduction in aquaculture. And I think maybe that's why majority of people that are here are not into aquaculture. Why do we have this? Why, why are we experiencing this? We discover that because of increase, especially in the inputs, especially in feed. Most of the feed that we use in aquaculture are being exported, uh, sorry, are being imported. And it's highly, highly expensive. Uh, we need to begin to look at integrated aquaculture. Somebody mentioned, mentioned aquaponics. Yeah, yes, aquaponics, but the way it is done is different. But aquaponics in our own way, because you have to begin to think of integrated agriculture or integrated aquaculture. Uh, and that's when we talk about rice cooked fish. In my institution, we have been able to establish that rice cooked fish will give you most of the fish and you get rice. We have poultry cooked fish. These are what our farmers can engage in in order to be able to utilize the limited available farmland that we have, and you get better results. Um, water quality, both in quantity and in quality. Uh, my department has been able to, you know, we're talking about even watering our vegetable irrigation. Uh, the last speaker mentioned that we do not consider the water that we're using in watering these vegetables. Because at the end of the day, you discover that most of the waters that we have these days, in fact, that's the area where I, conduct my, I conducted my research, they have heavy metals. But it will not have immediate effects until it accumulates to a certain extent in our system before you begin to see the effect. What we have been able to do is to develop a nanoclay uh, filter that will be able to reduce to the barest minimum. In fact, in some, we are able to get the heavy metal completely um, removed from the water before you can use them, either for watching or even for aquaculture itself. That has been done, and we have it available. And that is why I would suggest that when you are doing a wonderful job, uh, you need to please begin to partner with institutions and research institutes because they have a lot. Just like the, this agri publication is supposed to expose us to what we are doing in the institutions and research institutes. You will discover that there are a lot of things that are available. Yes, uh, because our mindset, the other publish or perish. Uh, we want to, once you enter academics, you want to reach the peak of your career. And the peak is becoming a professor. 
You understand? And consideration is publication. We have a lot of them. But after publishing these things, they are just there on the shelf. We need industries. We need farmers. Uh, because we are experiencing problems on the field. We want to go in research that it is uh, demand-driven. In the sense that you have a problem on your farm. Please approach institutions. You have experts there that will be able to solve such problems. Sorry, ma. I will soon... Then fish seed. You understand? That's the hatchlings. Fingerlings. It pains me at times that you discover that people from north, from immediately you leave Kwara, Ninja upward, people go as far as Ibadan to go and get fingerlings. Why? You understand? Well, it's understood because there they have, they can produce whole year round. But in the north here, because of our climatic condition, it is a little bit difficult to produce whole year round. But my institution has been able to um, develop a production system that will allow us to be able to get fingerlings and produce fingerlings all year round. All we need is industry coming to finance or commercialization. Because when these things are there and nobody is coming, it will just remain on the shelf. And that's why I'm trying to tell you what we are doing as an institution and what is available. And I know in our, all our universities, you have more than this that are available. And I would suggest at this point that the trade fair that you're proposing in November, it's a very loadable idea. And you please, I want you to please reach institutions, especially institutions of, um, where you have agriculture, Department of Agriculture, School of Agriculture, Culture of Agriculture. You will discover that we have a lot. Let them come and um, showcase what they have done in the institution. Agric engineers are here. Uh, I know some a student uh, in agric engineering department was asking a question. You understand? Well, they have done a lot, even in my institution, in terms of equipment that can be used in this agriculture. We have them available. But because we are just an institution, it remains there. Uh, so we're using this opportunity to tell you that they are available. Also, part of our problem, because I said the feed is very costly and we use um, um, imported feed most times. It is because the imported feed is a floating feed. But my institution has been able to develop feed that floats even in water using locally available uh, materials that you do not need to go outside the country. These things are available. It's just that we need people to come and to tell them they are available and will um, get there. In all of this, research is very, very important. And that's where all this NIFRI, NIOMA, you need to partner with institutions and I emphatically say funding, funding, funding. It is very, very important if we want to get to where we're supposed to get to. Thank you very much. Please, and a round of applause. I meant to understand that the other person I mentioned will be doing a separate presentation. So he's the only one that has presented for this um, paper. Actually, the idea I had was like going to be a kind of um, round table discussion. You make your paper, you present your paper. Do you have a kind of a think tank where you have a um, discussion? They deliberate and come up with some action points. But I didn't see that as the workshop I had in mind. That notwithstanding, the questions can come up. You direct your question to either the first presenter, the second, third, or fourth presenter. And then please, we just have a few minutes to round up on this. Anybody to give? Can we have the roving mic, please? Sure. Okay, thank you. The convener. Once again, let me thank uh, all the presenters and the facilitator. It will have been a nice opportunity to once again meet with my friend, Professor Sharubutu, who we drank Gary together at the University of Ibadan in our postgraduate studies. So I know he would have uh, cracked some jokes here now to remind us of that journey. And I'm pleased that you have done a very good job, having been 
under uh, tutelage, I know that you will not disappoint. Uh, convener, once again, I've come again. <laughs> because uh, when you instigate trouble, you see more trouble. So you have created more problems by this avenue, but positive problems anyway, because this is it's not an indictment that uh, this is what we expect government to do. And if government is not able to do it, you are filling the vacuum very well for us. May God bless you, ma. From the discussion that have happened, the submissions, I'm wondering whether if Ferrari University of Technology MENA is, uh, is just coincidence or accidental, but no, whatever it is, I think I'm very proud that uh, the young intellectuals from that university are blazing the trail. Congratulations, FUT MENA. My submission is a challenge for all of us here, and particularly the convener, as I've said. I will start with the publications. Publications in scholarship must, of necessity, impact on the society. And I will give a very good example. When I was in my early career years, with a PhD about 27 years ago, I was inspired by some scholarship publications I received from the United States. And about 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, when I was introduced to one of the leading American presidential scholars, Avin Singer, is an Indian descent trained by Everett, Everett Rogers. Everett Rogers is the diffusion of innovation. I'm going somewhere. And Everett Rogers, when you read his book, in fact, about 10 years ago, his book was the most cited document in the world. Because if you are in the industry, or you are a practitioner, or you are a scholar, with anything that has to do with innovation, you need to read that book. So I've, when you read this story, you realize that at a point he didn't go to school. But his farmer, his father, farmer, was an experimental station for students from Iowa University. So when they come, he normally watched how his father was struggling with researchers and students from Iowa. So he picked interest. One day, he followed them to Iowa. That was the end of the story. That nobody gave a background which school he went to, but he ended up with, as a graduate and ended up becoming a world-renowned professor of development communication and wrote the book, The Diffusion of Innovations, in 1962. That book has been revised and revised until he died about eight years ago. But where am I heading to? If we insist on publication that, no, that has no impact on the community, it's going to be a problem. Just recently, in my own book submission, I was invited to Amadou Bello University area sometimes in 2014 to present a keynote, just as you are doing here. And I was wondering why the head of the department invited me. He now let the secret out of the bag that they got a $2 million grant from MacArthur Foundation because of the proposal they wrote from the book I wrote, that the publication was what they used to advance a, a, a proposal. And MacArthur gave them a $2 million grant to establish Center for Excellence in Development Communication. So when they were commissioning it, they said I should be part of the ceremony. And I felt on top of the world that when I wrote that book for students, I didn't write it to make money. I wrote it in order to impact on them. And it was like almost free for students to just come and take away. 
because of the information available. So this publication series that you have brought to this table is that all of us in the industry must come out with a publication that can impact on practitioners, on students, on even scholars. Because, the convener, you will not appreciate the impact of this two-day workshop. If all that is coming out of this, we are able to generate a document which will be referred to as WENA conference proceedings, where some of the synopsis <laughs> of the information, the rich information that is coming out here, is summarized for presentation or for launching in the next year's conference, I'm sure the impact will be more that people are looking for some of the clips, some of the information that have been presented so that it won't go away just after this conference. That is why I say I have come again. Now, I guess this is the time that I should challenge ARCN. And please extend my well wishes to Professor Sharubu too, that we should have a follow-up round table to this discussion, where all the practitioners, the scholars, and NGOs with all these novel ideas and information can come together and dissect all the issues based on sectoral interest, aquaculture, fisheries, crop, livestock, and even social eco-balancing is also required. Because when you have the ecosystem that is in crisis as a result of climate change, people are not aware that husband farmers conflict that has degenerated into banditry and other social crises is rooted out of somewhere. In 2016, I participated in a workshop at the University of Ibadan on invitation that I should come and share my town and gown experience. How can we address the issue of cattle rustling? Which was the thing that was prevalent then. It has not degenerated to mandatory or kidnapping. And one of the suggestions I made was that government should come with all mandate institutions like Shika in ABU, uh, VET, a Veterinary Research Institute in VOM, and all of them should come together and articulate a solution whereby there will be technologies that can trace any livestock that you own in your farm so that if it is anywhere, you can trace it and you don't lose it in case somebody should uh, rust to it. You can trace it somewhere. Unfortunately for us, it has generated into banditry because most of the full animals, they have lost their cattle. And there's no replacement. So they have gone into criminality. I'm talking, now, Madam, please, one minute. They have gone into criminality. We are not solving the basic problem. If Shika and other mandate institutions have been able to produce enough cattle to replace what has been lost, as we are doing for Uncle Borrower's program in rice, as we are doing for other sectors, we would have addressed the issue of cattle rustling and the conflict that is coming out of it. On that note, I thank you and I hope you will take my message home and work on the round table. And I know Sharubutu will be interested as a vet doctor. Yeah. You'll be interested in this end solution package that will address it. Convener, thank you once again. I, thank you. Thank you, sir. And it seems the question is more on my own side or the comments on publication. When I started, I was actually saying that Publication does not stop with peer review journal, which I've also highlighted. Because it's about getting the information to the end users. When we go too high in technical papers, you find that at the end of it, or the beneficiary may not even get to know about it. So I also, in my own presentation, which I didn't show, or which I didn't deliver, we can go out of communicating only in English language. This can be translated into three major languages when we have the key information we want to disseminate. 
So the, we also have an institution that's in charge of the extension publication, that's the National Agricultural Extension Research and License Services in Zaria. So but what, what you have said is well noted. I'm going to take information to him like you rightly said. If he's here, the difference will be there. So I'm not wearing his shoe. I'm only under his knowledge that you rightly said, but he's, he has passion for what he's doing. And I can assure you in two years, the gigantic work he has done is speaking for him. So I know what he said is also part of his pro, uh, desire to have it solved. He's a great doctor, like you rightly said. He, he has mentioned something about that. So I know I will take the message back to him and I pray that sooner than later, that be what you requested will be granted. I know he has that passion for that too. He has opened door for private sectors to come. During his tenure now, we have been having so many people coming in. And one group that I wanted to mention to the convener is the vulnerable group. That's a group that came to our office recently, that the vulnerable people have women, we have been always abandoned. But they're doing a lot in agriculture. They have products, but they don't have a voice. Even here in Abuja, they have their headquarters. They, some of them could not walk down wheelchair. They, were, they moved to office. It was really pathetic. But they are producing products, especially with all these um, ginger uh, dry products. But they need a platform to really give them the support. So I, I wish you can take that. I'll get back to you on their real name, what they go as. Then the other thing on them. Um, what you talked about publication, I also want to emphasize the fact that it can only be on print. On uh, print, we also have the media, and like I said, we now have our TV. So with the intention of going wider than what the paper can do, and then the issue of um, digital now, the fact that with your smartphone, somebody can enter YouTube and see what is happening, even in our uh, TV. Uh, media that I'm also hoping that this event will also be aired there. I'm, I'm going to communicate that to ES. I believe he will honor that if they can also send their footage. It can also be, I don't know if you are aware that we have our radio TV now. Okay. So the issue of grants is another thing that you mentioned, which can go a long way to help our institutions. It's not just lying on governments that need to go for grant winning proposals that will go a long way. Even if just to put up structures or facilities, we have a solid equipment for our laboratory analysis through grants. We can get a fund that will go a long way to solve that. So universities should also key into that. There are opportunities there that they can also leverage, not just they're waiting for government. Government cannot do it alone. Any other question, please? Do we have more people to ask question? I'm about to, okay, please can someone give her the microphone? Thank you so much. All protocol duly observed. I am happy check by Adama and I work at Lycos Farms. Okay, so before I start, Lycos Farm is an agricultural enterprise. We produce catfish and vegetable. We just started operations. So um, I was quite um, intrigued by what the last um, facilitator said about um, food mina having structures in place that hedge aquaculture, hydroponics, and aquaponics. Okay, so um, during my research, I got to realize that there is like um, an escalation of um, feed, feed prices for fish currently. And at the other hand, we are trying to ensure that aquaculture is being like widespread in Nigeria. So the question is to you, sir, what is um, Food Mina doing currently as a research institute to ensure that more of our feed supplies are, you know, not necessarily imported, but we are getting it locally so that it can as well aid um, fish feeding without spending so much money for um, for the um, uh, hearing of catfish. So that's just my question. Thank you, sir.
Yeah, thank you very much for that question once again. And like I said, I'm happy at least now I have seen somebody that, that resembles me. Um, your question, uh, it's in a way of collaboration. I will give you my card. Uh, FUT Mina is doing a lot in terms of feed production uh, to make sure that, you see, in, in aquaculture, the major, it says 70% of cost of production is the feeding. And it's just because of the resources, the inputs, especially the fish meal. And we prefer, I don't know why Nigeria prefer to just go and export and bring to this place. And like I said, I think one of the problem is that, you know, catfish, because we culture catfish more. And catfish, they prefer floating feed. And most of these imported feed are floating feed. But the FUT Mina has been able to produce uh, with locally available materials, uh, floating feed. So from there, please, we can talk. Yes, please. Anyway, I just want to you cut you. Much. Thank you. I think I've done my job. Thank you. I really want to appreciate um, Her Excellency for inviting us. And we did at the beginning. We do better things. And uh, I know I have a proud ES. So I wish you pay him a courtesy receipt if he's not tight for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Please, another round of applause. Wow, a lot of solutions towards carbon food security have been churned out today. But importantly, importantly, all of this work, all of this initiative must be published. They must be put out there. That was the reason for this particular workshop. Because like it is said, if you don't publish the work that you're doing, you're like a man who is winking at a woman in the dark. She will never see you. So we must put it out there. Whether it's biodiversity, whether it's smart irrigation, whether it's technology, it's whatever it is we're doing, we must put it out. So this takes us to the next uh, session before our final workshop. We have a presentation by Japtini Energy. I think we have a 15 minutes presentation by Japtini Energy. Uh, is the representative here, please? Okay, Japtini Energy is represented by Mr. Eleaza Ogulu. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At this point in time, I think I would want to say a big thank you to the organizers of this program. Um, it is evidently clear that majority of us here will be leaving this venue with a renewed mindset. Am I right? We're leaving this venue with a renewed mindset. And I want to ask a question. If you're living here with the mind of going to invest again in agriculture and your principal source for production happens to be water and your water is not good enough for your production and productivity, of what good will it be to you as a farmer? The two last speakers spoke very well. And you just agree with me that when once your foundation is destroyed, your production is over. Am I right? Am I right? And I would want to say that without water, there is no green. Sir, am I right? Without water, there is no green. Without water, there is no blue. Without water, simply put, there is no life. And if you feel you want to go into aquatic life and your source of water is contaminated, and you spent probably 10 million, 1 million, 100 million in that project, your state will be so miserable that you will believe that the witches in your village are against you. Sir, so am I right? 
And you will agree with me now that we must go back home with the mindset of looking at the importance of our water. I don't want to go further because the two last speakers almost did exactly what I wanted to say. But I want to pick on some few components that they talked about. One of the contaminants he mentioned, heavy metals. Imagine that you have one of the heavy metals, iron, in your drinking water. I want to use Her Excellency. The water beside her now, if there is iron in it, there is no possibility that she can raise it up and put it in her mouth. Am I right? Sir, so I guess I will face the both of you now. Because it's like we're coming from the same angle and direction. So if there is iron in that water, you cannot drink it. Imagine now that you have a big fish farm. And your water, the pH value you did not check. And your pH value is so low that your water turns acidic. What becomes of the lives of your fishes? They would die in no distant time. And that would be like a misplaced priority, a wrong investment. So I want to ask, before you leave here now, what kind of water do you intend to work with? Yesterday, we had so many presentations on irrigations and all the rest. It is evidently clear that water is being used for irrigation purposes. Imagine now that your source of water is contaminated and you're using that water to spray your plants and there are pathogens inside of your lines. What becomes of your products? You will find out that you will begin to spend more in trying to replant. Meanwhile, your foundation, your principal component is faulty. Now, because our time is up, you will agree with me now that if your water is very good and you're a livestock farmer, your cattle will begin to grow well. Am I right? Why? Because they drink from that water. Their milk production will be increased. There won't be death even amongst them. So, ladies and gentlemen, even as we go, let us begin to have a rethink. Let there be a paradigm shift in our thinking now. Let us lay more, more emphasis on the source of our water. I want to tell us as farmers, that if our water is contaminated, in geology, there's what we call fate and transportation of contaminants. If your water is contaminated and you're using it for farming, part of what aid this transportation of these contaminants are one, porosity, two, permeability. Once your soil is porous, your rate of percolation is high and it percolates straight on even down to your aquifers. So your artificial recharge is even contaminating the groundwater. And what happens to it? You will just find out that you have destroyed the ecosystem within that your farm region. Okay, let's leave heavy metals. What about if your environment is prone to fecal contaminants, of which most of us seated there do not even pay attention to it? If I ask how many of us that has boreholes here, yeah. if you check where your borehole is even situated, it's even close to your septic tank. Am I right, sir? It's even close to your septic tank. And what happens? High rate of percolation, you're also destroying that aquifer. So fecal contaminants is something we need to even pay attention to. Some of us might feel, okay, we don't have borehole, but we're using the river water. All of us in the village that don't have toilets, I'm from River State. Part of our toilet and source of water is still the rivers. And when you do all of that, you are using it again for same agricultural purpose. You will find out that you are busy destroying the ecosystem. I think our time is fast spent. 
I would not want to take our minds too far. But I think I would want us to leave this event with a well-guided mind that before we continue, while we're having a rethink, there is need for us to get it right. I think I want to thank you, Ma. You've done well. All our presenters, you've done well. To the two last speakers, I wish to meet with you again. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you very much, sir. Please, a round of applause for him. Okay, we've come to the highlights of today's great event. Thank you very much for staying with us this far. It's been a long day. Thank you very much. And thank you, ma'am, for sitting through. Thank you. Our final workshop for today. You know, from the beginning of the conference, we've been told that we need to export. But for us to export, we need to take them through the right export processes. And one of the critical elements of those processes is the appropriate certification. So the next workshop is going to deal with organic farming and certification. It is brought to us by NYSAT Limited, and the CEO of NYSAT Limited, Mrs. Annabel Kamuche, who is ably represented by Mr. Raji Toby. Is he here, please? Right. Thank you very much. A round of applause for him as he comes. Her Excellency Aija, Ajia Aisha Babangida, professors, doctors, CEOs here, and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Toby Raji, and I'm here from NYSAT. I'm here to represent our MD. She um, unavoidably absent. And I'll be presenting on organic agriculture and certification. So please, I will employ the media to please project slides. It's going to be very brief. Yes. So what we'll be discussing very, very briefly is on organic farming and certification about conformity assessment and certification for Nigerian goods. We'll be discussing about why organic agriculture, why organic farming, why do we need to get certified in the first place? So please, um, let's go on. A very quick introduction about NYSAT. NYSAT is made up of two subsidiaries. We have NYSAT Limited, which is the certification arm. Um, we have entered a partnership with a French, a French um, based company, Ecoset, where we leverage on that partnership to actually certify for international standards. We certify for organic, we certify for HACCP, we certify for ISO, we certify for halal and a host of others. So that is who we have basically. We have a partnership with them on that and we have worked with government agencies, we have worked with NGOs, we have worked with um, a host of other ministries. And our approach is actually to synergize the value propositions of the stakeholders within the chain to create um, a resource in that um, regard. Please, the next slide. So this is still basically talking about NYSAT and ECOSET. So ECOSET has actually been in existence for about 30 years now. And they have about 60,000 clients. And we are their representatives in Nigeria. So we are like the local partners, we do audits on their behalf Why the certification comes in the name of Ecoset. So that is brief introduction on who we are. So please, um, the next slide. These are business sectors. Like I said, we have two subsidiaries, the certification arm and the training arm, because we realize that before you can even comply to international standards, because these standards are private standards, they are not mandatory, they are market driven. So before you comply with them, you should understand them. You should know what the standards are about. Because if you don't know what the standards are about, the requirement, you would just um, have what you call non-compliances. You would not, you are not in compliance, and that would definitely delay when you get certified. So that is where NYSAT Expert Consulting Limited comes up. We do training and communication, we do consultancy, 
We do project management for, um, an example is the Anchor Boras program. We provide monitor and evaluation for that. We also do studies and um, stakeholder engagement. Why for NYSAT Limited, the certification harm, what they do is pre-audit, they do audit in itself, they also do corrective, on, um, corrective actions. So please, the next slide. Yeah, so um, conformity assessment, they do for input attestation, the input to be used on the farm, the product certification, the process, transaction certificate or certificate of inspection. If you are complying with the standard, there are some documents that should accompany even the certificate. So we provide all of those things. We also provide certification for QMS, that's quality management system, ISO 9001, religious certifications like halal, like kosher, and pre-audit inspection. Pre-audit is actually like uh, an initial audit, so to speak. Before, because if you apply for certification now, we want to even check if you have the capacity, if you have the um, ability to even pull it off. So that is um, the period, the corrective action plans, um, the verification. So that's just basically introduction to NYSET. So we, these are the logos of organic. I'll still come back to some of these things. So please, let's quickly go to organic now. And I, would, I was here yesterday, actually, and a lot was said on organic agriculture. And I would just basically dwell on the last point. Organic is a regulation in that, unfortunately so in Nigeria, anyone, I mean, can just label their products as organic. They can just say, oh, this is organic. And it might actually be organic. But if it doesn't pass through the process of certification, it would not be accepted worldwide. So organic agriculture is a holistic production system that promotes and enhances agro-ecosystem health, including biodiversity, biological cycles, soil biological activities, and a lot of that. So for example, now we all know that if you are talking about organic agriculture, you things like use of manure, use of um, absence of mineral fertilizers comes to mind. But when we are talking about regulation, it even goes further. How do you even use this manual? When should you use them? So that is why it is important that we know that for us to access international markets, for us to access markets like the US, like the EU, you have to comply with their standard. And like the saying goes, if, you, if um, someone says for you to enter their house, you have to pull off your shoes. You have two options. It's either you pull them off or you go back. So that is why it is very important to know that they, they are private standards. If your market is not demanding for them, it would not uh, make sense business-wise to get them because they are not mandatory. They are not like some, they are not like NAVDAC, but they also offer premium. If you get organic agriculture certification, the uh, your off-taker over there knows that you have complied with their standard and they are willing to pay you premium. So that is um, basically what organic agriculture is about. So the importance is safe food. If you are certified, if you are eating an organic certified product, you are sure of safety. You are sure that you will not get any form of um, hazard from heat. So that is same, same food. No harm is done to the soil. We are all talking about climate smart agriculture. We are talking about how to improve on um, global warming, how to reduce it, how to trap carbon that are so evident in the atmosphere. So um, certified products are access international markets without fear of ban or rejection. It is no longer news that, um, should I say, periodically, we get a lot of bans, and it is really um, not good for the image of the country. So, but if you are certified for organic, if you have organic certification, there is no fear that you get rejection on your product. Then the sustainable approach to agriculture. Agriculture, the, one of the main aims of sustainable agriculture is to make sure that the things, the land, the people, and the ecosystem you are using now would still be able to be used even after now. That's sustainability. 
what are the ways we can use our soil? What are the ways we can use our ecosystem? What are the ways we can even use ourselves as people? The people working on the farm, the people eating it. What are the ways we can use so that we are sustainable? It is not that you use the soil now and the children after us would not be able to use them. So those are the things that organic agriculture intends to address. And the principles are there, the principles of ecology, the principle of health, the principle of care, and the principle of fairness. In that, if you are doing this organic agriculture and you intend to get certification, let me state at this point that there is a difference between compliance and certification. You can actually comply to a standard without getting certified for it. So it is, if you, are, if you want to get certified, you must actually comply with all these principles. Compliance is, oh, I know that I'm not supposed to use um, beyond this particular amount of manure per hectare in a year, I complied with this. But certification is actually when a third party, like NYSERT in partnership with ECOSAT comes and verifies that what you say you're doing, you're actually doing them. They check your people, they check your products, they check your process, they check your records. When you applied manual, how many kg did you apply? How did you apply them? So all of these things are what makes up the certification harm. Please, the next slide. So the organic, the global organic food market is about um, 168 billion in 2020, and it's predicted to grow even higher by 2026. And fortunately, in Nigeria, there are products we have comparative advantages over, like the honey, like ginger, like hibiscus, soya beans, and sesame. So we'll see in subsequent slides that we have actually been able to certify a, some producers that have actually exported their certified products. And with all these potentials, we are still not there because these products do not conform. If the producer do not un, does not understand what he's doing, he would not be able to appropriately comply and conform to the standard. So it is really important that we understand first before you even apply. After you have gotten the market, understand what you are complying with before you um, apply for certification. Next slide, sir. So a market can be classified into the local market. That is um, within, let's say, Nigeria now. The regional markets, like we said yesterday, we are looking, we are hoping, and we are believing to tap into AFCFTA. So if we have certified products like that, we can leverage on that and even earn forex coordination. Then global market as offered in multi or inter-regional markets. So please, next slide. From our studies of international markets um, trends and market intelligence, the most promising lucrative market for Nigerian products from, uh, is from the EU and the US and recently in the Middle East. So, I will, let, me, let me give us an instance at this point now that if you have market, it is important that you do as they want. I was in um, a farm in Niger State in January, so the man told me that he wants to do organic rice. I have not really heard of someone that wants to do organic rice. I've only heard of products like ginger, like sesame, and all of that. But because he said he has the market, so he is going for it. He is going to get certification and is going to export its product as organic rice. So if you have the market, if you know where you can tap into, you can actually obtain this certification. So please, the next slide. Next slide, please. So um, the knowledge gap is the thing, one thing that is affecting uh, penetration of the international market. There is poor awareness. There is absence of conformity assessment and certification according to the international standards, and there is also absence of factors that can facilitate these exports. So conformity assessment now and certification. We have talked, I didn't really want to do much on um, organic agriculture because we talked about it yesterday and I really have limited time. But conformity assessment is the process of verifying that the requirement of a standard has been applied by an operator. As a standard requires it, you have complied with it appropriately. 
So if a standard says, oh, you can only use this on, uh, on your farm for organic according to the issue, then you comply with it. If a farmer says, okay, even, even though you can use manure, but you can't use more than this particular amount, you can't use more than this at a time, then you have to comply with it for it to be organic according to their standard. Because in this, in this um, value chain, in this sector, in this organic sector, there is no standard that is applicable worldwide. There are equivalents, of course, but there is no single standard that you can use that is say is one size fits all. It is according to the market that you are targeting. It's according to the people that wants to buy your product. That will determine the kind of standard that you will comply with. So that is for um, conformity assessment. Then certification is the provision of a third party, made by a third party that a product, a process, or a system meets the requirements of a standard or regulation. Product, process, process that led to the product, or system. System, the people, the documents meet with the requirements. So conformity assessment is the product process leading to certification. And organic certification ensures that Nigerian products do not get rejected or banned in the global market. Certified organic products can have assurance that there will be no fear of rejection. Hence, the need for conformity assessment and certification. So product certification, very briefly, is the process of certifying that a certain product has passed performance test and quality assurance test and meet criteria. You have a product on the shelf now, let's say um, processed ginger now, powdered ginger. The process, the certification, product certification is uh, um, the process of verifying that that particular product meets with the requirements of the label on it. If it's labeled according to, let's say the USD organic now, United States Department of Agriculture National Organic Program, they have um, an organic program. If, it, if it's labeled that, oh, these are certified according to the USD NOP, then it, it has undergone what is called certification process to show that, oh, everything used for this particular product is allowed under the standard. So that is uh, for product certification. So benefit of product certification is it improves the farmer's livelihood because, like I said, even though they are not mandatory, you get premium you get paid more if you get certified for organic. It strengthens local supply and provides access to international markets, sustainability in the supply chain. It also provides competitive advantage. People in US, in EU, in Middle East, they have the economy um, ability to pay for some of these things. So you have competitive advantage even in the international market and also build trust, efficient traceability. Traceability, are, should I say simply records, records of what you do, how you do them, you are a processor, how do you clean your process facility, what do you use to clean, all of those things are very, very important to get certified and access to more local and international funding. Please, the next slide. So components that are necessary to access the market now. To access market, to en ensuring competitive advantage for the production of commodities of interest. Then compliance to regulation. I spoke about that earlier. Conformity assessment and product certification. External infrastructure. You know, the policies that is being done by a particular country also is a very important component because like, let me, let me give us an instance now. So, some countries, they, they don't allow that to Im import, or should I say, export some products to their country because they are trying to preserve their own local market. So even if you have an order for such a country, you should get the required information that, oh, in this country that this buyer is asking for, do they even allow that I export my products to their place? So because we have policies that can affect them. Then product research and development, awareness of market changes and trends, where is the market, what are the requirements. We know the market is in, it's mostly in the EU and the US, what are the requirements. 
What? Because if your if your buyer is even in the US and he's saying, "Get me EU logo," you have to get it for him because that's what he wants. So it is. These are the things that will help us to access a market. Next slide, please. Okay. So these are some of the companies that we have um, certified and are still under some are already under certification. Um, Anderson Technical Limited, Refer Millers, Kendake Honey, Wakot, Ocean Global, Refer Grow. So it is still a growing sector. We are still getting developed. But so far, we have been able to certify um, those companies. Products, the Nigeria organic products now in the national markets like beeswax, like bezai chili, ginger, hibiscus, honey, mango, moringa. Even impute, because you can do what is called impute attestation. That is the process of knowing that this impute can actually be used in organic. This, because you know mineral fertilizers are strictly prohibited. That is um, a low brainer. That is like the fundamental thing. You can't use mineral fertilizer on your organic farm, but you can use some organic fertilizers. So organic fertilizers undergo what is called Impute attestation to know what impute can be used to on your organic farm. So please, the next slide to um, quickly round up now. So this is just to like an add-on of opportunities that exist currently in NYSAT. We have buyers that are willing to uptake some organic certified products like hibiscus, like ginger, like sesame, like soya, like cashew, like turmeric. So what? What has happened is that they have contacted us that if you can get us farmers, if you can get us producers that can produce these crops, then we are willing to uptake. So we are just like a link between them, between the producer and the uptaker for um, some of these products. But they must be organic certified, of course, and the land must be a minimum of 200 hectares, and they must have the necessary document. So um, to round up, if the market is the house, then certification is the key. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so. If there are any questions, I uh, would like to take them you know, now. Thank you. The roving mics, please. Thank you. Uh, please, I was wondering if um, hydroponically grown crops can be certified organic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that question. So, no, you cannot certify for hydroponics under organic. And that's, I know we talked about hydroponics earlier. That does not mean that hydroponics is bad. It just means that it contradicts the principle of organic because organic is about soil. Hydroponics is soilless farming. So you can't do that under organic. Thank you. Concerning this hydroponics she mentioned, uh, aquaponics, will you still classify that one organic? Aquaponics is growing of um, crops on, is it water now, right? Yeah, but you're using water from the fish pond. No, you cannot, sir. I was doing, because that is my project topic that okay. I'm doing presently. Okay. And they are classifying it as organic. Okay, so um, let me just say, according to the standards that are prominent in Nigeria, the US and the EU, you cannot certify for that. So maybe some other standards that may not be as popular as this allows it. Like I said, there is no universal standard. But for EU, for US standard, you cannot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to, uh, the last 
um, the, they asked a question concerning aquaponics, and you said you cannot satisfy it. Why did you say it cannot be satisfied? For what reason? Oh, okay. Thank you very much, sir. So the same reason is the reason that applies to hydroponics, because you are not growing on soil. So any cultivation that is not done on the soil cannot be certified for primary production on the organic. So that is just, it violates what we preach. We preach we want to sustain the soil, the ecosystem, and the people. But if you are not growing it on the soil, then organic does not have business with it. And that does not mean that it is not good, it is not safe, no. It is just that it can't be done on the organic as of now. Should I go ahead? Okay, okay, please. Yeah. Um, why is organic food expensive? Okay. Because I believe that we all need to eat organic food. Okay. So um, why do we now? Why is it now expensive? Because if it's expensive, that means the local person cannot eat it. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So I would not agree that organic foods are expensive, but I would say organic certified food are expensive. If you know there is a difference between the two, you can grow your cowpea organically. You, can not, you may not use, any, you may fulfill all the requirements, but you are not certified for it. That is still organic food. But if you are going to get certification, it is going to be expensive because it, the processes are actually um, a lot. Before you, before you bring auditors in to go to your facility, before you um, check for the compliance, it, it takes money. But what we preach now is this. You can start complying so that you are even sure that, oh, this thing I'm eating is good, even if you're not going to be getting certified for it yet. But organic certified foods tend to be more expensive than conventional food because it is for a niche market and it is um, based on the premium. Because if you, are going to be, um, if you are going to be spending a lot on certification, then as business people, you should get your returns back. Because certification um, might be a bit expensive. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I'm asking as a layperson. Then he said, if it's not uh, on the soil, it's not going to be considered. Then what about livestock? I also hear of uh, maybe uh, poultry being organic, organically red, or the um, maybe fishery as not being you no know, chemical or whatever. So. Do you also certify those for organic, those uh, crop, um, livestock, livestock, or fishery. fishery for organic? In that case, how do you go about that? Okay, so you can actually certify them. The soil applies to crops. It doesn't apply to livestock, per se. There are requirements for those ones. The reason why I didn't dwell on livestock is because there is, the market for livestock is still growing. So for out of the 16 companies I showed earlier, none were for livestock. So what people do majorly is crops. So, but of course, you can certify for livestock, even though they are not necessarily red on. Of course, if you want to do poultry, you can't do them um, outside. You have to do them inside. So the soil applies to the crops. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if there's any other question. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. As regards the certification, uh, I know in Nigeria, the usual, the usual certification requirements takes from the seedling to the grain to even the transportation model before and shipment before you can actually be termed organic based on ECOSAT's requirements. But at the moment, some people that actually need that attempt to get the certification license, there is always a problem of the entire value chain. 
even ordinary transportation, sometimes they mix it up in the context of trying to cut corners. Are there existing structures, being in the industry and being a regulatory body, are there structures in place now that have been able to take care of that value chain that actually facilitates people getting in the market for them and getting it over there? Okay, so if I, if I understand your question very well, you're asking how measures we put in place to ensure there is no contamination of organic products. Okay, so yes, there are measures in place and there are sanctions as well. And one of those measures is periodic lab testing. So you should test your product periodically. Because if, you, if someone is handling your products for you, it is your integrity on the line. It doesn't matter if um, Mr. Adamu is the one driving the truck and he changes. You have to make sure that all those things doesn't happen. So that's one thing. Uh, it's also important to treat your staff very well. Because if you treat people that work with you very, very well, they will not, they should not cut corners. Because if they do and they are caught, they would, the license will either be suspended or withdrawn. And I will give you a further instance now. I will not mention the name of the company, though. They have issues of pesticide residue in organic. Organic that you are not even supposed to use pesticide at all. They have high pesticide residue and they are, they are still battling it now. So they, can't, for, they have started the process of correcting everything now, but it's taking a lot of time and they might even be flagged and no one wants to work with them again. So it is very important. Okay. Are there any other questions, please? Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Production, processing, production and processing would require the requisite standardization systems and certification to be fit for markets and for exports. And we must bridge the gap in organic farming and the gap in knowledge in organic farming and certification to maximize export potential for sustainable agriculture and food security. This is so important. Another round of applause for him, please. We believe that the conversations these two days will not only spark the paradigm shift in the agricultural sector, but it will serve as a catalyst for a monumental ripple effect in our economy as a country. So we have curated all of these deliberations, these very recondite deliberations into a communique which will be delivered by the winner communications manager, Mr. Adelani Bogboade. Please, a round of applause as we welcome him. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, permit me to stand on. Um, all existing protocol. I'm here to present the communique issued at the end of the fourth winner conference at Ladi Kwali Hall, Sheraton Hotel, which held on 26th and 27th of July, 2022. Um, the communique will be sent to you directly to your email addresses and um, would also be published by the press. But we'll be highlighting some of the key recommendations from all the deliberations at the conference. There's need to accelerate there is need for accelerated political will to drive the implementation of agricultural related policies. There's need for renewed investment in research and development in promoting food security and agricultural sustainability. There is need for concerted effort from agricultural stakeholders and ecosystem to create a viable agricultural marketplace and e-commerce platform. Agricultural students in high institutions should be exposed to innovative agricultural practices such as smart farming, hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics, etc. The government should invest in greenhouse technology to enhance learning on agricultural innovations. There is need to bridge the gap between development finance institutions and smallholder farmers to improve access to finance for scalability. The adoption of innovation in agriculture should be a function of geography scalability and sustainability. 
government and stakeholders should invest in locally fabricated materials to enhance the scalability and acceptability of innovative technology in agriculture. There is need for universities to provide practical training to students on modern technologies and best practices in agriculture. There is need for continuous interaction through e-platforms to allow for continuous learning and experience. Irrigation systems are critical for food security as it ensures the production of food all year round. Crop production packages developed by institutions should be diligently followed. Adoption of smart agricultural practices is essential for enhanced food security. There is need for the development of efficient water harvesting technology. There is an urgent need to also develop efficient agri-precision technology. There is need to embrace community-based seed and seedling production system, especially in greenhouse technology. Integrated farming should be embraced for agricultural sustainability. There is need to also ensure community-based agroforensic system for carbon trading. Right-based management system is essential to allow for the sustainable management of water resources. It is essential for agribusinesses to also maximize the opportunity available locally and globally by leveraging tech platforms. Finally, there is need to develop a local market and market information system for our agribusinesses. Thank you. Please, another round of applause for him. Wow. It has been an amazing and exhilarating two days. Please, I want you to give a round of applause to yourselves for staying this far and for pulling this through. Please, another round of applause. Another round of applause. Another round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Winner has been at the center of it all. Indeed, Winner is rethinking boundaries. And one person has been at the forefront of all of that change. Her Excellency, Aisha Babangida. Please, let's give her a round of applause. As we go forth from here, we're bringing the conference to a close. It is hoped that we would put all of the initiatives, every deliberation here today, every decision taken here today, we'll put all of them to work to ensure that we continue to rethink the paradigm shifts in agriculture and ensure that we enhance food security. And we're going to close the conference with the second stanza of the national anthem, which is our national prayer to see that God indeed goes with us and ensures the success of all that we have done here. May we rise to our feet, please. And we're going to recite it so that it's a prayer from our hearts to God. Are you ready? Okay. All right, so one on the count of three. One, two, three, go. O oh God of creation, Direct our noble cause, guide our leaders right, help our use the truth to know, in love and honesty to grow, and live in grace and truth. Great lovely heights attain to build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. Amen. A round of applause for yourselves again. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for making the Fourth Winner Conference a maximum success. Indeed, we're rethinking paradigm shifts in agriculture and we're taking great initiatives to enhance food security. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.